This is part two of a two-part series on the importance of Picasso to modern art. If you have not seen part one, click here to check it out, or if you like to consume your media in a more out-of-order sort of fashion, feel free to start here. In our first part, we discussed the early life and works of Picasso, his rise to cultural dominance, and the often repeated yet always relevant impact of Cubism, all in the pursuit of one simple question. Was Picasso the greatest artist of the 20th century? So, is he? Well, maybe. Cubism is pretty good and all. But there were a few other factors at play, one of which, from this point in Picasso's life onward, would become ever more dominant. His fame. The acclaim he received for his paintings would see Picasso become a household name and elevate his notoriety to levels previously only achieved by kings and genocidal warlords. And all of this fame was seemingly just from a few paintings. Well, it wasn't just a few, it was quite a lot of very expensive paintings. Picasso sold a lot of work and commanded very high prices after his rise to fame with Cubism. He sold work to influential longtime clients like the Steens and Peggy Guggenheim, as well as the rich and famous in general. After Cubism, his brand, if you will, as the modern painter became solidified, and the myth of Picasso as the master of modern art spread far and wide. This growing fame was aided by the fact that Picasso happened to be a rising star around the time modernism was really taking hold in many areas of society. Part of this was bigger, faster, and more sensational mass media. Unlike in the days of Cezanne and the Impressionists, by the time Picasso was doing the rounds, there was radio, cinema, newspapers, all featuring stories from all over the world, as well as more or less reliable global travel. Word of the latest developments in the Paris art scene now travelled around the world in less time than ever, and Picasso was just in time to take advantage of it. The result of this was Picasso gaining fame and power in ways that no other artist ever really had. Artists for centuries before had been seen as a sort of skilled tradesman, but not much more than that. But under the influence of Picasso's new powerful public persona, the role of the artist would transform into something resembling a new kind of public figure, one which today we might term a celebrity. Picasso's rising celebrity came from a few different factors, the chief among them was probably the fact that by the middle of his life he was both absurdly wealthy and well known. The position he found himself in was totally unheard of for any artist before him. He could do and say just about anything he wanted to, and frequently did gaining a reputation for making grandiose claims about himself and his work, as well as for being a playboy who lived an extravagant lifestyle. He socialised with the rich and famous, married and conducted affairs with a string of women, and splashed his cash in increasingly expensive ways, famously buying a castle to live in with a tower for painting and a barn for sculpture. During this time, his work reflected his self-image as dominant and powerful. Images of the women he loved and symbols of mythological masculine power such as minotaurs would become common motifs. Having conquered the stifling academic bureaucracy of fine art, both Picasso himself and the public at large perceived him to be powerful, macho, and daring. Attributes which helped to spread his myth and further power his celebrity. His bombastic attitudes naturally made him welcome in some circles, and more despised in others. For example, the freewheeling modernist bohemians of Paris were pretty fond of him, though conversely, he wasn't exactly popular in Germany from 1936 to 45 or so. The Nazis were not fans of Picasso in his modernist ways, to say the least. Before the likes of him and the modernists came along, art was generally under the control of church or state. Not so with these new modern art movements, which were, as the Nazis saw it, thumbing their noses at tradition, and encouraging degenerate behaviours. The mocking degenerate art exhibitions were a pretty clear example of how the Nazis felt about the whole modern art thing. This probably wouldn't have been too much of a problem for Picasso if it had stayed confined to Germany, but much to his and the rest of France's dismay, it wasn't long before German boots were marching their way across French soil. Many of Picasso's contemporaries in Paris fled to the safety of England or the States to avoid the persecution that they would face under Nazi occupation. Picasso, however, remained. Perhaps fueled by his own tough guy image, he refused to flee and instead stayed in Paris for the duration of the war. During this time, like many of his fellow citizens, he faced harassment from the Gestapo and threats from party officials. One, perhaps apocryphal tale, of Picasso's time during the war goes something like this. During a search of his studio by the Nazis, 
A German officer is supposed to have eyed a photograph on the wall of a painting Picasso had completed some years earlier. The picture depicted a scene of tangled figures with contorted expressions strewn across a canvas. Above them, a strange light bulb-esque shape hangs like an all-seeing electric eye, taking in a scene of total carnage. The Nazi officer, upon seeing this image, supposedly turned to Picasso and asked, Did you do this? To which Picasso replied, No, you did. The image in the photo was Guernica, a massive painting which depicts the bombing of a Spanish village in which German and Italian forces had participated. Guernica was a small town in the heart of Basque country. It was seen as a major meeting point for anti-government republican forces during the Spanish Civil War. These republican forces were comprised mainly of communists, socialists, anarchists, and many others who were opposed to the nationalist regime of Francisco Franco, who held power at the time. Guernica was picked as a target because of this. But there was another aspect to the attack that made it particularly abhorrent. While Guernica did host a factory which created weapons for anti-government forces, the factory was not the target. The target was the town itself, which was bombed mercilessly for two hours during market day. This atrocity is one of the first major instances of civilians being targeted by mechanised ordnance in the new models of war that would become prevalent in the 20th century. The incident left people aghast at the possibilities it hinted at, and Picasso in particular was vulcanised to say something, being as he was a Spaniard by birth and already not a great fan of the Francoist regime. Picasso had often said that painting was a weapon to be used offensively and defensively. The power of an image can be just as striking as a bomb, if it's handled just right, and that's just what Picasso did. Inspired by the news from his homeland, he constructed an enormous picture depicting the horror of what had unfurled. Much like his previous work, La Demoiselles d'Avignon, this work would not seek to imitate reality. It would instead seek to immortalise the atrocity in Picasso's signature style. In art, the goal is often the articulation of an idea, such as love, fraternity, loyalty, or loss. In Guernica, the idea being articulated is chaos. The busy streets of a town on market day are transmuted into carnage in an instant. When we look at Guernica, we see what we often see in Picasso's work. Curvy profile faces with weird expressions and blocky chunks of black or white tone. But as we look closer, we see that these symbols and lines are conveying disaster. From this tangled mess, we can discern many figures. A horse rearing up in terror, a woman holding her dead child screaming in grief, body parts strewn around in disconnected cubist piles. It's a scene of horror that most people of the day would not have been familiar with, making it difficult to convey just how disastrous this event was. Yet Picasso's bizarre flat and broken forms seem to do a better job of evoking this chaos than any realistic depiction could. The way the paint is handled, coupled with the grim monotone colour and the fragmented composition, creates a work that evokes its difficult subject in a visceral fashion. Its lack of colour is reminiscent of photography, which gives it an air of a documentary style. Its flat, matte painting lacks the grace and polish which a more traditional painting would demand, which seems a wise choice considering the delicate subject matter. Even its scale, which is reminiscent of the genre of history painting, where artists would commemorate great events and deeds in huge dramatic paintings, plays into Picasso's composition. History paintings typically glorified and commemorated great events such as battles, religious scenes, or the affairs of states and kings, but this history painting is far from glorifying. And the only thing it commemorates is the horrors of mechanised war. The comparison to history painting is fairly obvious, but what is truly illuminating is the differences between the traditional methods of history painting and Picasso's Cubist version. Picasso's Cubist stylings render the scene in a different light. As we have previously said, Cubist works render multiple angles and dimensions of its subject all at once, creating a strange, impossible view. Picasso's rendition of Guernica does just this, and is perhaps more evocative at capturing the tragedy than the traditional methods would have been. It depicts the complexity and the chaos of modern warfare in a way that is more true to the actual chaos than the traditional, often sanitised, history paintings would have been. Instead of maudlin dramatics or noble heroics, we see carnage, a view of war and atrocities that most would probably agree is more accurate than the sentimental take of many history paintings before it. We can argue today over how effective Guernica is at its job, 
when we are regularly shown images of war and just such mechanised attacks on the news. Perhaps now, Picasso's work is not so relevant anymore. But then again, perhaps it still does hold some power to make us consider the damage war can do to those caught in its wake. The image of Guernica, by its very existence, has come to stand for the horrors of war. Famously, in 2003, many years after Picasso's death, a copy of Guernica, which was hanging in the United Nations, was removed during a series of meetings about the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Despite the almost centuries worth of time and many political differences between the wars in those nations and the Spanish Civil War, Picasso's Guernica manages to capture something so basic to the human experience that it is still seen as relevant even now. Picasso would ride out the rest of the war in Paris, seeing its occupation and eventual liberation firsthand. During this time, he would further solidify his political views through not only his interactions with the occupying Nazi forces, but also through his dealings with the French resistance, which gained his admiration and support for their efforts during the war. Their dominant ideology, communism, became an appealing school of thought for the artist and would influence his ideas going forwards. While artists tend to be somewhere to the left of the political spectrum more often than not, it seems strange to us now to think of Picasso as being a member of an ideology that had Stalin at the head, who, similar to the Nazis, by and large rejected the project of modernism in the arts, in favour of, well, pictures of Stalin. Picasso's declaration of support for the Communist Party was seen as something of a big deal. The artist was at the height of his cultural relevance, and his symbol of peace, the dove, was quickly adopted by the Communist Party as a visual shorthand for their supposed intentions. Picasso would, for the rest of his life, have some sort of association with the ideology, though how much he was really invested and how much he was being utilised by party agents for his unique celebrity status is up for debate. Either way, the political declaration tells us something interesting about the power and sway that Picasso held at this moment. Firstly, the Communist Party accepted his support, despite not liking his artwork very much. And secondly, the Americans, who you might have guessed were not very happy about having a major cultural figure declare for the Reds, did... well, nothing. There was no mass rejection of Picasso or Cubism, no burning of canvases in the streets. Those were worth far too much money for that. Instead, the politics of Picasso took a back seat to his market value, and the cult of his celebrity. In these matters, we can see how Picasso's fame and power put him in a position where he could say and do pretty much as he pleased, something that would become increasingly common in the celebrity culture that emerged in the 20th century. There is one area which shows us a clear line of descent from Picasso to today's celebrities, womanising and scandal. The rich and famous are often in the news today for illicit love affairs, morally ambiguous behaviour and generally getting up to no good, and Picasso was no exception. In fact, he may have set the rule. If there was one place Picasso was more prolific than the studio, it was the bedroom. Over his career, he had a slew of wives, girlfriends and mistresses, and his dalliances were often common public knowledge, owing mainly to the fact that he would paint pictures of his latest infatuation. For example, his portraits of Marie Therese Walter depicted her as beautiful, soft and inviting, without showing her face, for it would have alerted his then wife, Olga, of the presence of a rival. He similarly depicted Olga in his work as regal, porcelain, and not much fun. By making such private matters public in his work, Picasso implicitly seemed to agree to making a media circus out of his love life, and by making it okay, others would eventually follow suit. When we consider that in decades past, the media would often not report on such private affairs, even if they were common knowledge out of a sort of gentlemanly agreement, such as the now famous cases of JFK and Marilyn Monroe, we can once again see the influence of Picasso's fame. So, what are we to make of all this? Well, we can see how Picasso dealt with the politics and culture of his day in ways that artists before him never really had, perhaps because the times he lived in were so different to any that had come before, and different times required a different kind of artist. From his politics to his private affairs, Picasso had become something else. A new kind of artist. The cultural shaman and bohemian intellectual who would pave the way for the art world we see around us today. Where political statements are rife and the cult of personality surrounding an artist is often more important than the work itself. 
The likes of Jeff Koons, Damien Hirst, and Tracy Emin are all very much following in the footsteps of Picasso, and the strange new way he determined an artist was to work in the new modern world. This is, in essence, what is so important about Picasso. Not the cubist paintings or the bizarre, flat-gurning faces, nor his often contradictory or half-informed political statements. It was the fact that he did these things when artists were not supposed to. He turned the idea of the artist from that of a simple tradesman into a bohemian cultural intellectual, and set the tone for what art and artists would become over the 20th century. And he did it all by turning the artist into something that resembles our modern notion of a celebrity. As Picasso aged, his status did not. He became the old master of his own day, reaching heights of wealth and influence that were unheard of. The artists who followed him were doomed to repeat and follow in his footsteps, creating works that would for the most part live in his shadow. All told, during his long career, Picasso had made about 50,000 pieces of art, many of which were made in these final years, each one signed and dated as if to try and preserve their moments. These final works are often ponderous, and if you believe some critics, not very good. Perhaps at this point, Picasso was past the prime of his powers. But then again, that may not have been what he was doing. Picasso often equated painting with virility and sex, the essence of life itself. In those final days, when his flame was fading, it seems to make sense that he would retreat to painting as the last bastion of that life-giving force. Almost a century later, and the Picasso model of the artist as celebrity is dominant. So finally, we arrive at our answer. Is Picasso the greatest artist of the 20th century? Well, maybe. But the greatness of Picasso lies not as we might think initially in his work, but instead in his words and his deeds, his politics and his fame, which have had such an impact that they have reshaped our very conceptions of what an artist is.